personal meaning to us. Uh, and then we watched the Rolling Stones, uh, Rolling Stones uh, concert movie. Okay. And during that time that you're there with your dad, you're, you're using a vape pen to smoke marijuana, right? Yes. Consuming edibles? That's correct. Your dad is as well? Yes. Drinking alcohol? Beers at that time. Okay. And does your dad use any other drugs? Um, he takes uh, pain pills uh, for his knee and, uh, and hip, I guess. Um, so he took some. Okay. And do you know how long he had been taking pain pills? I want to say for as long as he's had pain. Um, you know, I know of him. I've seen the, the medical uh, lab. I've, I know of him taking Percocet for a long time. Um, mainly because he has bad knees and hips. Uh, you know, he plays a lot of sports, so uh, I know he takes pain, kills, pain pills for his, you know, his injuries from playing sports all the time. Okay. Were you aware of other health issues that your dad had? Um, I mean, he had, you know, heart problems in the past. He had uh, triple bypass. Um, he had, um, you know, um, had a, he broke his neck. Uh, he was in Brazil, uh, and he was body surfing in Brazil, and he, the, the wave took him down. He landed straight on his neck, and he actually broke his neck. Um, he, um, you know, had some, you know, he, he, he said he was depressed before, you know, at some time after my mom died. Um, he doesn't seem depressed. You know, he seemed like he was just same old guy, but you know he had he had he had talked to some people about that and talked to me about that. That was one of the reasons why we went to the Keys for um, you know holidays because it's a sad time when you, your mother and your you know your wife aren't yeah, isn't around for the holidays, first holiday. And so when you were in the courtroom, you heard the state playing a conversation that you had with the detectives on April the first, right? Oh yeah. Okay, and in that conversation with the detectives, you're really sort of downplaying the health problems that your father had. Is that the way that you perceived it? You perceived him as being healthy? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I feel like by myself I'm healthy. I, you know, my, I feel like my dad's healthy, and he's had some problems. It's just, I, I guess, the way we look at things, you know. If, if we can play 18 holes on Sunday, you're healthy. Okay. All right. So you also heard during the course of the testimony that the state played some little recordings from the Amazon Echo at 7.50 <coughs> and 8.05 that were setting a timer. Yes. Um, and what was going on at the house at that time? That was when we were preparing dinner. Okay. So you cooked together that night? I, I don't do much cooking, no. But okay. my, my dad, my dad does it on the grill, and we warm some things up in the microwave. Okay, and you ate with him? Yes. Were you present when Betty Butcher had called the house? Yeah, that was like right after we, right after we were done eating. Okay. Yeah. And you were watching TV at that time with your father? We were. I think Survivor was on at that time. Okay. From 8 to 9? I think it's on 8 to 9, yeah. Okay. All right. And so after you finish watching Survivor that night, what do you do? Um, you know, we, we start probably watching an NBA game. Um, I, I'm chatting with, you know, girlfriend, um, probably some other people. And um, prior, to, uh, prior to that, I actually started doing some cocaine. Um, my dad... Didn't want to do any. He said he had a good buzz, and you know, I knew he was going to get up the next morning early to go play tennis um, or go watch the tennis match. So he didn't partake in any, um, which, which wasn't, wasn't unusual. Okay. Well, when you say that you were doing the cocaine, it was there in that family room, right? Yes. <laughs>
I'm going to show you um, what has already been admitted into evidence as states 18 W. Okay, and do you recognize that area? Yes. Okay, and what is that area? Um, it's been referred to in this in, as a family room. I guess that's what we would call it, the family room. The TV's over here, and there's the L-shaped couch, and the, um, my dad's chair, we call it, and then there's like a little coffee table here. Okay, and so the recliner chair that you see in that photograph, that's where your dad would normally sit? That's correct. Okay, and I'll show you, this is State's... I think this is State's 18T. That's the couch with the TV? That's correct. Okay. And the State's 18R? Yes. Okay. That shows the recliner, the couch, and that center table? Yes. Okay. And so is the center table that's there in the middle of that, that room, is that where um, you were doing drugs from? Yes. Okay, and tell me how that was set up. Um, when, when, we, when we're just smoking marijuana, it's basically we just set the marijuana on the table there, um, you know, either the, the vape pen or the, um, or the, the bag of marijuana for, for smoking. Um, and um, for when, when we do cocaine, we have a little bit of a, I don't know, I, I don't know how to call it, but it's like a, a hors d'oeuvre server kind of a dish that kind of is raised up a little bit, and it's like a platform, kind of a circular, uh, maybe sits, you know, six inches or so high, that normally you'd serve like hors d'oeuvres from or, you know, like a cake or something. Um, so that so that's kind of the uh, what we would do cocaine off of. Um, so that's what I had set up uh, on that table there. Okay. With the cocaine? Yes. Okay. But at the time that you're talking with your father, he doesn't want to do any because he's getting up in the morning. He said, I have a good buzz. Okay. All right. Um, so is there a time later that night that you leave the room? Yes. Um, I, I smoke cigarettes, um, and my dad doesn't want me to do it in the house. Um, you know, my mother died of lung cancer, so it's not really a, I should, first of all, I shouldn't be, but, you know, it, I do. And um, so I generally go back out to the back uh, patio, um, back by the pool. Um, there's an area, there's a little table area, so I'll sit back there. Um, was your mom a smoker? She was, her whole life. Yeah. Okay, until she was diagnosed with the lung cancer. Yes. So smoking between you and father was something that he didn't like to see? Not, not too much. I mean, occasionally he, I would do it on, I mean, we'd, I'd smoke cigars on the golf course in front of him all the time. But um, in terms of cigarettes, you know, I, I, not, not much, not much in front of him. Okay. So you go into the back patio area where the pool is? Yes. And how long do you think that you're back there? Um, probably for, you know, from like 9, I want to say like 9.30, 9.45 till, till I found him on the floor. Okay. And so the text messages that we talked about earlier today involving your friend Mayara. Yes. Okay, that run from basically 9.37 p.m. to 11.28 p.m. That's a time period where you're outside? I probably, right after I started texting with her, um, is probably where I went outside. So okay. shortly after, whenever time it started, I would say shortly after that. And when you're texting with her, are you doing anything else? Um, I probably have my iPad with me and I'm using my iPad. Okay, and using your iPad for what? Um, and to watch things on, on, the, on the iPad. We were, we were talking about a, a soccer game, so um, I may have been watching the soccer game on the iPad. Okay. During that time from, you know, roughly 9.45 to 11.30, um, do you see your dad at all? 
No, I don't see him. Okay, don't have any conversations with him? No. All right, is there a time that you go back into the house? I think I went to the bathroom one time. Um, I probably cut right through my, uh, my the, the back of my dad's uh, bedroom opens up to the, to the uh, pool area, so I probably went and used my dad's uh, bathroom okay. and then came back out. And if you went into that bedroom, would you be able to see where your father was in the family room? No, you wouldn't. Okay. When do you next see your father? Um, I, uh, I come, come inside. I, I guess, you know, it was somewhere around 1130, right after I was uh, con done communicating with Mayara, you know, within 10 minutes probably of that. Um, I come in the back door, and um, I, I don't see him in the chair the back patio door I don't see him in the chair and as I come around I see him he's on the floor kind of on his side between the the table and his chair um, kind of with his head rested against the uh, the couch and I yelled dad are you okay and um, no response um, thought maybe he just passed out or something so I kind of grab him and shake him a little bit and nothing I checked his pulse at his neck there was no pulse at all. Um, I tried to roll him over. I mean, it's kind of a tight little quarters there. I kind of tried to roll him over um, and, and pushing on his chest. And he, there's no response. He, um, he, he's, he feels like he's not, his, his body temperature isn't what it normally is. What, you know, it feels not cold, but like he, it had happened, you know, a little bit before then, certainly. Um, he had knocked over uh, all of the cocaine that was on the, um, the cake server, the appetizer server. That was on the floor, it was on the couch. Um, it was on him, and um, he was just kind of laying in it. And my, my, once I saw all of that, my first, reaction was that he might have done a line of cocaine and just passed out onto the table. I don't, I wouldn't, I, I didn't, I, I couldn't imagine anything else that happened to cause that. At that moment, it didn't occur to you that he might have died of natural causes? No, it didn't, uh, honestly, it didn't occur to me till there was no cocaine <laughs> in the system that I found out, you know, that I asked you three times, you sure, you sure? <laughs> All right, so... But so from what you saw, the way that it was, it looked like he had done some cocaine and fallen forward. That's fallen, yeah, to, kind of to the side, yep. So you thought that he had perhaps overdosed or caused his death by the use of, uh, I mean, a plethora of drugs that night. Yeah. Okay, and did that worry you? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was scared to death. You know, I was very worried. Um, what was your mindset at this time? Were you sober? No, no, no. I was, I was more buzz drunk and high and stoned than he was, certainly, because of the cocaine that I had done. Um, and you get paranoid sometimes when you do um, cocaine. So the first, you know, um, my first reaction was, oh, no, you know, they're gonna, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to get in trouble because he was, he died snorting my cocaine. You know, um, but but I, I I had to. Uh, my next thought was I got to clean up all of this cocaine. I got to you know there was we had a box of edibles there. Um, I got to get rid of that. You know, and um, you know, honestly, I didn't. You know, I I, I should have called nine one one, but I I, I didn't want to face them in my current state. Call talking to the police and talking to. Um, you know, any ambulance people at that time. Okay. That was my, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know, as terrible as it sounds, I was afraid. Right? Was your dad, was he a large man? He was bigger than me. I mean, he was probably 220, maybe, something like that, 220 pounds, but he was solid, a couple of inches taller than me. He, I, his, I, I tried to move his body, I, I, you know, I couldn't. I mean, I could... Roll it over, but there's no no chance I could lift lift it. I I I've got my I tried to. Okay, 
And so when you couldn't lift him and you couldn't clean up the drugs from around him, what did you do? I mean, I thought uh, I needed to find a, you know, I, I, I needed to find a way to move him, you know, out, either put him into this bed or just move him enough so I can clean up. Um, so I went out into the garage, and um, I remember a long time ago, I used to have a, a dolly, and, you know, half, half of the garage has got my old stuff in it from, um, you know, when, when I had a big place. And um, so I thought maybe that either my old dolly was there or, and dolly's a hand truck, it's another word. For, I know they're using the word hand truck in here. Um, or that maybe he had a dolly. Um, so at least I could kind of put him on it and move him, move him out of it. Um, so the only place that he would, it would be would be in the garage, um, you know, back in, in the north, you know, the corner, northeast corner of the garage, um, you know, where the power washer and the generator are and my dad's golf clubs and those kinds of things were there, but there wasn't one. And so you've heard the testimony that at 12.30 uh, in the morning on the 29th that you're Googling for 24-hour Walmart. That was the only place I could think of that might be open that might have a dolly for sale. Um, so I ended up... Uh, Going to the first, I wanted to, I, there's, I, the one that I normally went to when I lived in Delray was the one in Boynton Beach on Federal Highway, you know, maybe about maybe 10 miles um, north of, of, the Del, of Atlantic Avenue. And um, so I, I, I probably Googled to see if that was open 24 hours because I, I, I wasn't sure. And so then I, you know, I drove there. My, I shouldn't have been driving in my current net condition, but I was panicked and scared and said, I, you know, thought I had to move, move my dad's body. Okay. Did you find anything at that Walmart that would help you? No. Um, I asked a couple people. Um, you know, I think they had a wheelbarrow. Um, that wasn't gonna. That wasn't gonna help. Um, but so they didn't. They didn't have. They didn't have it. Um, so. You've heard the testimony in the courtroom about the number of times, four, five, six times, that you come and go from your father's house in the Prius between 12.45 and 6 a.m. Yeah. Where are you going all of those times? I mean, uh, I went to the, uh, the other Walmart on uh, military and I think it's Linton. Um, I, I, I probably went to a couple other places just driving by to see if some places were open. You know, I was just, you know, uh, I mean, part of it was like, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to go back home and deal with that too. You know, I mean, I, my, my, it was horrible. Okay. And so eventually you wind up at the Home Depot. So I got back to my, yes, I, I. I know Home Depot opens up at 6, and I know they have dollies there. Okay. So you go to Home Depot. Yes. You're seen on video buying both a dolly and a gas can. Yes. Why? Well, the gas can, I thought that, you know, if I ever have to explain why I, why I bought a dolly, I can explain it as, you know, I... Um, needed to move my dad's power washer because it's really a two-person job and get to lift it um, and to put it in and out of the uh, uh, the back of the truck. And I know he ha has a gas can that doesn't have a top on it. Um, so, I, again, I wasn't thinking anything other than, you know, I need to, you know, possibly justify why I would buy a dolly at that time. I'd already started thinking, you know, what, you know, what am I going to say? How, how, what am I going to do? That kind of stuff. Okay. And so, at that point in time, when you buy the the dolly, what is your plan for how you're going to handle it? Well, I mean, I, I, there's really, 
I would never say I ever had a plan, you know. Um, my, my thought was to kind of roll him over onto the dolly um, and then pull him out in, at that, by that point, you know, it had been, I don't know, seven hours, six or seven hours maybe since he had passed away. You know, I, maybe I should just put him in, in his bed. Um, that way I could, when I woke up, you know, um, he, he was dead in his bed. Um, and I needed to, you know, finish making sure that there was no um, cocaine or marijuana stuff in the um, family room area. So I ended up... Did you put him on the dolly? I, I did. Um, you know, I kind of like rested the dolly uh, against the uh, couch and then just kind of worked him onto it. Um, and then I kind of pushed the dolly, kept keeping it really low, so he's laying on it, um, out uh, in front of the TV, um, into the hallway. Dolly's long. I mean, I don't know, it's four or five feet. My dad's six feet. So once you get into the hallway, you have to kind of lift it up to turn it. And that's when, you know, it, it problems occurred in terms of him starting to fall off the dolly, you know, uh, me banging it into the walls. It was, it, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't move it. I couldn't, I couldn't balance him on the dolly and work it around the, the tight corner of the, um, of the hallway. Uh, and I ended up just kind of falling and dropping, you know, the dolly with him on it um, and just kind of breaking down and, and, and crying at that point. Um, like, what the hell, you know, what, what, what have I, what has just happened? What's going on? You know, uh, just the whole enormity of the situation um, presented itself, I guess, at that, at that moment. And at this point, by the time you have attempted to move him to the bedroom unsuccessfully, yes. um, it's getting to be early morning hours, 7 a.m. or so? Yes. Okay. And is there a time where you remember that he has this commitment for Miami with Betty Butcher? I, I do remember. I did, at that, after probably 15 or 20 minutes sitting there, um, what thinking? What am I going to do? It, I, I, I am reminded that my dad had said seven or seven thirty. I thought in his, uh, in his conversation with Betty. Um, I mean, I know my dad had been seeing Betty for a long time. I didn't know if maybe she was meeting at my dad's, my meeting at my dad's house, or uh, my dad was going to pick her up. Um, all I knew is my dad's dead body was on the hallway. And Betty might be coming over shortly. Okay. And so what do you do? So I, um, I took my dad's phone and sent Betty a text, um, basically canceling uh, their, their date to go to the tennis match. Okay. Do you know Ernie and Margaret LeDuc that live across the street? Sure. And what is their relationship with your father? Um, friends, you know, obviously neighbors, but um, friends, partners in the care, caring of my dad's cats, certainly. Okay. And you knew that Ernie had a key to the house? I did. And that he cared for the cats when your dad wasn't around? Yes. Did you have concern about Ernie coming to the house? I did. I did. Um, not as not as not as strong at that point uh, of Ernie coming to the house as I was for maybe um, Betty, but um, it it did I did have concern, and I you know um, I felt like at that point I had to you know my dad had to leave at some point soon. At least his car needed to be out of the driveway because Ernie would have if he saw my dad's truck in the driveway for beyond the time that. He probably knew when he was leaving to go to tennis, he might just come over and, hey, what's going on? Everything okay? Kind of thing. Okay. 
you knew that Gary Goodwin had been visiting? Yeah. And that he was expected to come back that weekend? I did know that. Okay. So ultimately, when you're sitting in the hallway after canceling with Woody, Betty, what did you decide that you had to do? Could, leave, could you leave the body in the hallway? No, I couldn't leave the body in the hallway. Okay, so what did you do? So I, um, I kind of worked it back out, uh, kept it low, and kind of pulled, put, kind of put, put, put him back on it. Kind of pulled it back out through the uh, uh, hallway, back in front of the TV, and then worked it um, back into the into the garage. Okay. And when you move him into the garage, do you do anything to help you with moving that? Um, no. Okay. And once you get into the garage. Um, you've heard testimony about this kayak that's in the garage? Yes. Okay, and did you move the kayak, the rubber kayak? I did. Okay, and what was the purpose of that? Um, to put my, uh, my dad underneath the kayak, so in case somebody did come in the garage, they would see the kayak only and not see my dad dead on a, on a dolly. Okay. Do you, um, at some point, leave the house with your dad's SUV? I do. And where do you take the SUV? I drive it um, to uh, down the road a mile or so uh, to condominium complex. It's got a parking lot. My, my friends, friends, good friends of my dad's and ours um, has a condo there. So I was familiar with the with the condominium complex, so I parked it there. Then I walked back. Um, my mind that was getting my dad's car out of the driveway for uh, like he was going to tennis match. Um, then I walked back and um, ended up taking um, at some point ended up leaving with in in, in my car. Okay, and at that point in time. And early in the morning of the 29th, did you have a plan about what you were going to do? Um, you know, at, at that point, I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe I should pretend like my dad and I went go to the tennis match because that would be. I don't. I don't think I texted Betty to say that I was going, that that, that my dad was taking me to the tennis match, but. That would make sense that if he canceled with Betty, that he would go with me. In hindsight, if I wanted to go to the tennis match, I would probably have gone with both of them. But um, again, I'm on 20, and I didn't I haven't slept in 24 hours at this point either, so I'm not thinking clearly. But at that point, it was okay. I need to go home, um, and then you know go to the tennis match. Okay. And you're doing this at that time essentially to delay having to confront these issues? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you, in fact, get into the Prius and drive to your house? I do. Okay. And once you get to your house, do you then leave there and go towards Miami? I do. And how long do you stay out of the house when you go to Miami? I want to say it was an hour to an hour and a half max. Okay, and is it the entire time that you're in the car and going to Miami, or are you just driving? Yeah, I get on, I, I mean, I, I start heading to Key Biscayne. I mean, um, I get on, uh, get on 95, start heading south, and um, end up getting off at the, you know, the Miami, uh, the Golden Glades interchange at that point. Okay, and do you go back home? I do. All right, and what do you do once you get back to your house? Um, I, I try to sleep. I, I you know, I, I try to just crash is the is the proper term for it, I guess. Um, but I, I can't. I could. I can't fall asleep. Okay. You eventually go back to your dad's house. I do. Yes. Okay. Now, before you go back to your house, to your dad's house, you hear testimony that there are a couple of times that you go to Publix with your dad's car. Yes. Right? At 
three something in the afternoon and later a little after six that day. Okay, and when you're at the, when you're in the Publix on the afternoon of the 29th, um, specifically the time at 3.39, you're buying um, household cleaners, cigarettes, and beer. Yes. Um. I mean, it, I, I, I basically come to the realization that I'm not going to be able to um, load my uh, father's body into the back of his, his truck if I'm going to, um, you know, bury it or if I'm going to, you know, do something to um, remove him from the house. And you're not going to be able to get him back into the bed? No, he had, I, he had, when, when, I, when I couldn't move him through the hallway and he fell off the cart, I mean, he, he had stiffened up at that point. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, you know, test his, his arms in terms of like that, but he was, he was stiffening. And I, at that point, I kind of knew that there was, you know, even if I, tried to find a friend or somebody that would help me, there was no way that he would probably be in a natural position in the bed after he had been on the floor um, earlier uh, all night. Um, and Why not put him back on the floor? I mean, I, I'd already moved, I had already moved his body. I had already, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I thought that at this point now, I've already I've already moved his body. Um, I've already went out, you know, um, you know, going to Walmart, going to Home Depot, you know, to move him back. You know, I, I don't. I watch CSI. I'm sure they could. Have, somebody could have told that I had moved the body. You know. I, so you had a fear that you would get somehow questioned or interrogated about this just because you had changed the scene around. Yeah, I've, I had that fear ever since I saw him, you know, dead on the ground. I had that fear that I had to talk to somebody about it. Okay. So between the first time that you go to the Publix at 339, and then at 625, you return to Publix again, you're buying garbage bags, paper towels, a mop. Okay, what are you doing between those two trips to Publix? Um, at that time, I think I am at the, um, uh, I think I get something to eat. I think I might go to uh, a drive through and get something to eat. Um, and then I am, I probably am, am back where my, uh, uh, where the car, where, where the cars were parked over at that condo. At Boca Tica. Yeah, Boca Tica. Okay, because you just can't go home? I can't, uh, no, I can't. Okay. At 6.25, you buy actually a roll of duct tape. And what was the purpose of that? The purpose of that was to um, duct tape them to the, to the dolly secure him to the to the to the dolly okay and do you do that i do all right by the time that you go home at you know roughly six thirty seven o'clock that night have you decided in your mind what you're going to have to do i have and what was that that i'm going to have to dismember my dad to be able to move him out of the house. Now, when he is on the dolly, is he taped with his front or his back part to the bracing part of that dolly? Um, his back. Okay. Do you leave him on the dolly, taped to the dolly in the garage? Uh, yes. Okay. And do you do that when you are dismembering? Yes. Okay. 
So you have heard the medical examiner talk about the fact that the body is cut from essentially back to front? Yes. Okay. Does his body remain on the dolly while you are cutting it? Yeah, because I, I rolled the dolly uh, over. Um, when I am um, doing the uh, uh, dismembering of the uh, uh, extremities. Okay. And so you are cutting those portions that are hanging off of the dolly? Yes. Okay. How did you sort of plan or set up to do that? I mean, is your dad just laying there in the open? Um, there's, a, there's a space in front of the, uh, uh, you, of course you've seen it all many times, in front of the refrigerator, uh, when you come out of the garage on the left side, and if you're looking on the left side of the garage, there's a space there. So I had laid a um, clear tarp down. Um, the dolly was on top of the cart, on top of the tarp. And then I had another tarp that went over uh, over the top of uh, of the dolly in in the in the uh, plastic tarp that was underneath the dolly. Okay. And so, when you are actually cutting through, you're using what? A saw. Okay. An electric saw or a hand saw? No, it's a hand saw. Okay, a hand saw that was at the house. Yes, it was hanging up in the garage. Okay, and when you are actually cutting him, are you doing that underneath the top part? Uh, yes. And why is that? Because um, I can't look at what I'm doing. I, I just can't. Okay. You, you heard some testimony from the medical examiner that there were some black markings on the body that they thought was magic marker. Yes. Okay. Did you mark him in any way? No. Do you have any idea what the black mark is? My only guess would be it's from the duct tape. Okay. The residue from the duct tape. That would be my only guess. Okay. I, def I, I did not use a Sharpie on my dad's body. Okay. All right. And so as you dismember a portion of his body, what do you do with that portion? I... Uh, I take a, a garbage bag, and I kind of cover let's, the 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 the, par, the part that is being um, dismembered. Um, so when the 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 arm, let's say, is finally dismembered, it's it's kind of falls into the the garbage bag. And with those garbage bags individually, what did you do with them? Um, when I, uh, I ended up, eventually ended up putting them all into um, three suitcases. Suitcases that were at the house already? Yes. Okay. How long does it take you to do this? I mean, it seemed like I was doing it all night. I mean, I know Dr. Mote said it was easy. Um, and, and maybe it's not, you know, physically strenuous. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, I would, it was not something that I, uh, it was a quick, <laughs> it, it was a long time. Um, I would, take frequent uh, breaks, um, go out through the garage door um, in th to the outside of the house, the side of the house, have cig smoke cigarettes, and just, you know, wish, to wish that this, was, this nightmare wasn't happening. Okay. When you eventually have the body packed <coughs> into these three suitcases, is it morning time by then? Yeah, it's. Um, I I I I want to say it's you know 
close to seven o'clock, maybe. I mean, six o'clock to seven o'clock. I I don't know. I wasn't watching the clock at that time, but it was certainly, you know, early in the morning. Sun was not quite up. It wasn't up yet. What do you do with the tarps? I um. I folded them all up and put them into a garbage bag. It's in of itself. And put it into suitcases. Okay. And is there a lot of cleanup to do after this? There, not really. There was not a lot of um, a lot of blood that was um, on the floor or uh, anywhere to clean up. But there was some. Certainly, towards the um, the garage, closer to where the uh, garage door was. You know, mainly from ma mainly from cutting through the torso. And how do you clean that up? Um, paper towels and some um, some of the cleaner bleach cleaner. Okay. Is there any blood inside the house? No. Um, so that morning, which would have been the morning of the 30th, what do you do with the suitcases? I, um, I take them out to put them into my, the back of my dad's SUV. And how did you get the SUV back? How did I get it back to, uh, yeah. at that? Wasn't it at No, it, would, it was already at, uh. It was already at my dad's house. Okay, so you brought it back before? Yes, that okay. night it was there. All right, and do you, when you go out to the SUV, do you go through the garage door or through the house? Um, to load up the, to, yeah, I go through the front door. Okay, and when you're outside and getting ready to load the vehicle up, is there anybody that you see out there? Two people. Okay. There was a neighbor that was walking um, that said hi to Skip. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was uh, Ernie across the street. All right. And did you speak to Ernie? I did. Okay. Um, and do you eventually load all of that stuff into the back of the SUV? I did. Are you the one who lays the seat down in that SUV? Mm, yes. Okay. And what do you do with it once you have it loaded up? Um, I drive it back to the Boca Tica condos. Okay. And do you leave the trunk there? Yes. All right. And where do you go? Um, at some point that morning, I go to uh, Starbucks at... Um, Yamato and um, Congress, and um, I have some coffee. Um, just kind of think about, you know, what what's going on, what, you know, about this whole horrific um, thing that I did. And um, try to th think about what you know I'm going to do next. And when you are at the Boca Chica condo before, do you see that there is some construction going on there? Um, yeah, they're uh, redoing all of the balconies. Um, there's no balconies in any of the uh, uh, condos, and so there's you know there's a lot of construction. Um, activity going on. All right. Do you eventually take your dad's truck with the suitcases in it back to Boca Tica? Yes. And what do you do there? Well, when I went to, when I went to Starbucks, I was in my car. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so when it's, when it's, uh, what time are you talking about with, with me right now? It would be on the 30th. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, as far as with my dad's truck um, that day, the only th other thing I think I remember doing with my dad's truck uh, 
other than driving it to the to from my dad's house to uh, Boca Tica, would be to go to to go to Walgreens at uh, some point in the in the afternoon. Okay. Do you go to Walgreens with the suitcases and the car? No, I I I, I had taken them out and kind of hidden them in 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 the, in, in bushes um, by the parking lot. At Boca Tica. In front of yeah, kind of near my car. Okay. And when do you go back to those suitcases? Um, late, you know, right after I went to Walgreens, I went back and then I put the suitcases back into, into, um, into the, the SUV. And then you take your car back to your dad's house, right? Um, at that point, and, and that, no, I don't, I don't. I, 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 home. Yeah, I think I, I do. Okay, and you spend most of the night at home? Yes. Okay. When do you go back for the suitcases? Um, when it gets dark, just before it gets dark. Okay. And what do you do when you get back to the suitcases after it's dark? I... Um, I open them up, um, and I um, take the, uh, um, the the lighter um, garbage bags, and I put them into uh, the construction uh, dumpster. Um, How about the bag with the tarps and stuff? The, yes, that that is that that also goes into the construction. Um, dumpster, I believe. What happens to the salt? Construction dumpster or a different dumpster, I think. Okay. And so when we're talking about the lighter bags, we're talking about your dad's extremities that yeah. go into the dumpster? We are. Okay. What about the larger sections of the torso that are recovered? Um... I can I, I can lift those um, into the dumpster, so I um, I wasn't sure exactly where I was, um, you know, on the golf course. So I um, I tried to uh, I basically decide that I need to maybe bury those uh, the torso and the lower uh, extremity somewhere out in the golf course. I know it's an abandoned golf course. Um, so I end up taking uh, one at a time uh, from where I was at to uh, cross the golf course to um, an area where there's a, uh, an old watershed, I guess. Okay. And leaving the suitcases there. Yeah, I take one and then... Um, then I take the second. I I'd rid, I'd initially, um, I think the first one I put inside the uh, inside the shed, and um, when I came back with the second one, I decided that I didn't want to leave them in the shed for some reason. So I ended up putting both of them in the back, in the back of the shed. Okay. Now on Saturday, March the thirty first, Mr. Goodwin comes home. Mr. Good, yes, he, Mr. Good, uh, Gary shows up, um, yeah, Saturday morning at okay. my dad's house. And so you've heard the testimony that you're telling Mr. Goodwin and Ernie LaDuke that your father's out kayaking with somebody. And that was the story. Right. That was the story. Yes. I, I, okay. I mean, you lied to them. I lied. All right. Um, on Sunday, April the 1st, you had plans to be golfing with your father? Yes. And Mr. Goodwin was there? Yes, three of us were golfing. Okay. Um, and that's the day that Mr. Goodwin suggests, like, let's call the police and report him missing? Yes. Okay. And you've heard testimony from Officer McHugh, who comes into the courtroom, about the story that you told her about him meeting a woman on the golf course. I remember. Okay, you lied to her. I lied to her. Okay, you lied to Detective Hanley and Detective Curtis, right? 
I lied to them. Okay, you lied to friends and family that called to check on your father. Right? Uh, yeah, I lied to everybody. Okay, and why? I mean, at that point, I mean, I made a horrible decision to not call 911. I didn't want to go to jail. I thought my father overdosed on my cocaine. You know, I mean, if if I had done the cocaine and died of over of an overdose or died from it and my dad thought that you know that at some point he would be responsible for my death for for what I did I mean I would wouldn't want him to go to jail I you know I, I didn't I didn't want to go to jail I, I you know and then one bad decision and another bad decision and a stupid decision and a horrible it, it just kept snowballing um, you know I had a set of you mentioned Gary was coming you know Betty I mean I had to make up a story to justify you know why my father didn't go to the tennis match the next day that um, I just had to make up something. Okay. Were you surprised when you learned that your father did not have cocaine in his system? Very surprised. Okay. I asked you, the, you know, a couple of times. I was surprised by it. And you've heard in the course of this trial that the state has argued that you killed your father as a way of getting to his wealth, okay? What did you know about your father's assets? I mean, he's on a pension. I knew he got a pension from, you know, after he got lost his judge job. I know he still got some kind of a pension. I think it was less than what he was supposed to get if he had stayed a few more years. Um, you know, I, I when I saw how much he had uh, in, the, in the court records, it was, you know, wasn't a lot, but it was more than I thought he had. Okay. You didn't view your father as wealthy? No. No, he's not. Okay. Um, the biggest asset he owned, you would think, would be what? I mean, I guess it would be the house. The, you know, I didn't know how, I knew he had a mortgage on it. I didn't know how much was the mortgage. Okay. You've also heard testimony here in the courtroom from the state that you were financially destitute. I've heard that testimony. Okay. And did you keep money in the bank? As little as possible. And why is that? Um, I was, I lived with cash. I didn't want to commingle, um, money that I got through illegal means with money that was earned through uh, other normal normal um, means, I guess real estate stuff. I also um, hadn't paid ta you know, the, the last time I paid taxes um, was a number of years ago. I paid like I don't know, 60 grand in taxes, and I was not happy about paying $60,000 in taxes. Um, I hadn't paid taxes in a while, uh, and I knew the uh, from, from a previous incident 15 years ago, I knew the IRS could uh, freeze my bank accounts because they had done it when I was when I was married at one time, and that's a horrible, um, horrible inconvenience. Um, when your bank accounts get frozen um, by the by the government, so uh, I always tried to keep 
you know, I mean, always tried to keep under a thousand dollars. You know, it was it was a game. You know, I had to put a little bit in to pay some bills because you know there are some bills that you've got to pay online. Um, I never, I'm, I don't own a checkbook, so I don't write checks. Um, it was just uh, for the last three years or so, it was a choice that I, uh, you know, that I made. So when you're talking about illegal monies, what, what are you talking about? Um, just selling um, edible uh, marijuana edibles and vape pens and the vape oils. Okay, and how did you get those things? Um, originally, we got them um, from Colorado. Uh, a friend of my dad's, friend of the friend of mine, but my dad's uh, friend, um, lived there half the year and um, had a medical uh, marijuana license and had had legitimate back issues and shoulder issues and hunched over all the time. I mean, he, you know, he was probably a real candidate for, even though he used marijuana every day of his life and he was a lawyer and he could function and work on that stuff, he did have a, probably a legitimate health reason for it. So it started with him bringing just stuff for my dad and I and a few friends of his just for our personal use. Um, and I, you know, I had kind of seen that the progression of um, marijuana becoming legalized, you know, state and states in medical medical ways, and then um, recreational. So, in I think it was late 2014, I took a trip to Seattle. Which was a uh, which had recreational and Washington State had recreational at the time, and I bought um, just kind of bought a, a lot of you know all you know all different kinds of medical uh, uh, marijuana products that were non-leaf you know syrups and you know candies and you know uh, they had like the e-cigarettes and. Uh, oils and all kinds of different things. Um, brought them back, um, and then uh, and then again in. Then I took a trip to California, San Francisco, and loaded up again. This time with a, a lot more. Bought a lot more um, stuff, and um, and I had already kind of uh, left my. Uh, manager job at Sotheby's and had kind of built up a close group of people that I could sell, you know, edible marijuana products to in Michigan and here. Okay. Now you've heard testimony in the case about um, you driving Lyft and Uber. Yes. Okay. And how does Lyft and Uber figure into this business of reselling things? Um, well, it originally, it originally started where, you know, if I'm, I was, if I'm going to <coughs> sell some marijuana and not have a, I, I, I guess I felt like I always needed to have at least some kind of a, legitimate income coming in, whether it's a uh, three or six month consulting job with a real estate company or whether it was driving, you know, Uber uh, or Lyft, at least I could show that through a 1099, again, I didn't want to be a W-2 employee, I wanted to be a 1099, um, I could at least have some income coming in. Um, what I would do is I would... Um, two ways I would use the driving in terms of selling. One would be to kind of hide selling to, fr to people locally by doing some Uber or Lyft drives around where they were um, 
where they lived, so it kind of kind of hided the fact that I was doing doing that. Um, and then the other was I, uh, you know, I would uh, mainly go. I did a lot of like from me picking people up at the airport, and so you know, the tourists, to tourists, After spring break they people. They need anything for the holiday. Yeah, you know, it always you know you know, you could look at I, I, you know I didn't study at Tuba, but you know, it was always blocks of time, you know, three months or a couple months, four months maybe, that, that you know, when I got a lot of, you know, edibles or, or were getting shipments in that, that I'd kind of do it that way. Okay, I'm going to show you what I've marked as 5A and B, and tell me if you recognize those. Yeah, that's a a vape pen like what you would sell and then there's in, in, in it's the little cartridge that you could sell that that, that, that they sell separately for, which is has the oil okay and that's the kind of thing that you would bring here or you would have someone bring to you yeah bring yep yeah, or you know yep yeah, that would be accurate. okay and I'm going to show you what I've marked as C and tell me what that is it's a stack of cash Okay. And it's a stack of cash with a photograph off of your phone, sir? I would, yeah, I would, I would, I would bet it was, yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the drug business is essentially, it's, it's, it's a cash business. Yeah, all cash. Yeah. Okay. And so when we look at your um, bank records, and we see deposits of $100, $200, $500 cash going in. That's money from the proceeds of your illegal business. Yes. And this is what you're selling. <clears throat> Can I give these to the jury, Judge? That and edibles. Well, I, well, are you offering them? Yes, I am. I'm offering them in depth. Same position of 5A and 5B. I have an objection. All right, they'll be received without objection. And six. I have an objection. You do or do not? I do. Okay, well, let's see up here at the bench. Thank you. So it's 5A, 5B, and 6. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs>
folks that the state attorney had object objected to 5A, 5B, and 6. I'm overruling their objection. I'm admitting these exhibits, and I'm going to ask the deputy, deputy, please hand it to the jurors. Thank you, sir. Just hand it to the first juror, let them pass it amongst themselves, and then we'll collect it and give it back to the clerk. Thank you. Mr. Next, Andrew, next question. I just want to, I'm going to show you the actual, um, those photographs with the metadata. I'm going to start with number six. Okay, so tell me approximately when that picture of the stack of cash was taken. Uh, April 11th, 2017. Okay. Or, yeah. And the two pictures of the vape, one in your hand and one that you're smoking, those are taken? Around the same time, April 8th of 2017 and April 14th of 2017. Okay. And so at that time in April of 2017, up until the time of your father's death, I mean, you were regularly engaged in the sale of drugs. I was. Cash business. Cash right? business. Okay. Now, the state has talked at length about um, some of your financial difficulties, for instance, your rent payments and... Um, um, a Mercedes that, that went back um, in March of 2018. How did you view your finances? I mean, same as I always view them. You know, I mean, I, as far as the rent goes, um, you know, I, I, was, I, I was behind in it, but I'm always behind in it. I, um, I've got a good relationship with my landlord. Um, you know, my uh, uh, my dad was going on a trip to Colorado in within the next couple of uh, I don't know within a week or so, um, and um, you know I knew I was going to you know have a lot of money coming in. Um, I had started. Uh, I was. I had. Uh, some real estate business that was coming in, you know, I wasn't concerned at all about my finances. I'm, I'm, this is I'm how never, you always yeah, I'm never, I, I don't stress over money ever. Okay. I mean, you saw that there was, um, the state admitted the application for the law departments that was filled out a couple of years ago. Yes. And there was a credit report attached to it. Okay. I mean, your, your credit was, Horrible. Garbage. Yeah. My, yeah. A couple of years ago, right? My whole life, I think. Okay, that's always how you live, sort of month to month, paycheck to paycheck. Yes. Okay, never been evicted from any place? No. Okay, you used to travel a lot. Right? Yeah, yes. And where would you go when you traveled? I mean... Since in the last three years, I think I've been to you know, 16, 18 places. I've been to Brazil four or five times. I've been to Colombia, been to San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Detroit a few times. Um, I've been to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Orlando a number of times, Jacksonville, Tampa. Okay, and traveled internationally quite a bit. Yeah, Brazil primarily, but I've been to Colombia. I've been, I think, 17 countries in my lifetime. All right, and um, the last trip that you took, is it fair to say, the last big trip was in 2017 to Colombia? Yeah, I, I think I was in uh, Detroit uh, in September, but yes, Columbia was April of April of 2017. All right. Um, you would regularly visit dating sites such as Columbia Cupid, right? <laughs> yes. Tender. Yes. Tender was you would pay the fees to be international to look or talk to girls in Brazil and Colombia. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and the state has talked about the fact that you were searching for places to stay in March of 2018, 
in Colombia and tell the jury what that was about. I mean, I was going to go to Colombia in, in April. Um, I had, last time I had went, I had stayed in a hotel. Um, you know, I was wanting to rent uh, like an apartment, do like an, like an Airbnb or, you know, something like that. Um, when I go, when I travel to Brazil, sometimes I'll stay in, a, in an apartment, sometimes I'll stay in a hotel. You know, I like sometimes to stay in, a, in, in an apartment because it's like you're, you feel like you're a local in the, in, in the, uh, in the community more so than, than when you're in a hotel. Um, but, I, you know, I'm in real estate. I always, I'm always on real estate websites. I mean, uh, but, yeah. Okay. You've also used the word text messages. Yeah. Between you and, sorry, is it? Mariyama? Mayara. 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 Yes. Um, is she someone that you met in another location? Yeah, 2015. Um, in 2016, I first met her. All right. And what was your relationship with her? Um, you know, we started an online friendship, and then, um, uh, we met, I, 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 f I flew to Brazil and spent time with her. Um, and she wants, she was coming to the, and she wanted to come to the United States. Uh, she finished uh, medical school in Brazil and she wanted to be a doctor here in the United States. And there's, uh, some, um, things she needs to do to be able to do that. And one of them was to get an observership, which is like an internship. And so I helped her to get accepted to the University of Miami and the Cleveland Clinic for her observership there. Um, so you've heard the voice messages about um, your offer to assist her financially? I heard them. And have you ever assisted her financially? Uh, a little bit, um, but nothing. I mean, I, I, it, well, it, it sounded obviously like that, like I was going to give her a, a American Express gold card or something. Um, you don't, you, Mayara is, um, I mean, she, her life is meta, medicine in terms of studying and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, giving her a credit card for her to spend might be, you know, um, $500 or $300 a month or something for her, get her nails done and that kind of thing. So it's not like, you know, she's out shopping for, you know, Manolo Blotnik shoes or, you know, um, going down Worth Avenue shopping. You know, it's just, that's not who she is. And that's not who I, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in women like that. So we're talking about, um, for instance, she had texted you earlier on the 27th before that voice message and asking for hundred dollars for some translation service. Yes. That's the kind of bills you were talking about helping her with. Yes, and and she doesn't she she didn't she doesn't want my help, but I would I, I want to help her. Okay. Um, I'm going to mark as exhibit four the exit video to the house. Okay. Um, and no objection. There's no objection to this judge. All right, that'll be admitted without objection. Okay. So, um, Mr. Scandarigo, this is a video that you've seen before? Okay. Uh, yes, I have. Okay. Mr. Scandarigo, do you want to publish for us? Thank you. How long is it? Uh, it says 12 minutes and 49 seconds. All right. What I'm going to do is, folks, uh, we're going to take a break now, a stretch break. Let you guys go in the back, use the restroom. We'll come back in 10 minutes, and we'll uh, continue with Mr. Scandarigo's direct testimony. Stay seated here. Okay. Mr. Scandarito, you can, do you need to use the restroom? 
Yeah, sure. All right, we'll go ahead and Mo, can you take them down to the restroom, and then you can uh, just go have, back and sit with your attorneys, and we'll come back and we'll get you back on the witness stand. Okay. okay. Thank you.
Yeah. Jurors entering the courtroom. Welcome back, everybody. Please have a seat. As you recall, when we just took that brief break, uh, Mr. Scandarito was on direct examination for him by Ms. Ramsey. Mr. Scandarito, I'll remind you that you're still under oath, sir. Ms. Ramsey had put on the screen there a uh, state exhibit, excuse me, defense exhibit four, and she was going to use that exhibit perhaps to ask her clients some questions, and you may proceed, Ms. Ramsey. Okay. So, um, Mr. Scandarito, you've seen this before, right? I have. Okay, and this is a video of the inside of your parents' home, right? It is. And what is the area that we see right here? I would call that the uh, living room. Okay. It's right inside the front door. Sort of the formal living room. Yes, it is. All right, and as you're going in, you can see all these little tables that have glass things on them. That's the way the house was always decorated. Yes. Okay. Much, many more things before my mother passed away. She gave a lot of that stuff away, but yeah, there's still a lot left. Okay. That's where we have, uh, it's a formal dining room. And you see the, the cabinet, the corner cabinet, and the china cabinet on both sides that have the glass doors. Yes. Hutches and... And this view looking out goes out to the pool area? Yes. This is that galley kitchen that we heard testimony about? Right, okay. yes. Okay, pretty narrow area. Yes. Um, and as you're walking around the house in this video, we can see, in addition to the tables and countertops, there are things that are lined up on top of all the cabinets. Yes. And things that are lined up on the top of the, the dividing walls. Yes. More glass. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is that pool area that you're talking about where you would be outside smoking? Uh, yes. This little area right there with the glass tabletop? Correct. Okay, that's the area that we heard the police refer to as sort of the eat-in kitchen area? Yes, that's that area. And this is the area that we're entering where this first counter is with the glass, but that over to the side is the area that you would call the family room. Yes. And there's a desktop, computer there, and some more shelving. Mm -hmm. um, there's normally four chairs around that table. Bottles that are sitting on the countertop. Yeah, wine. Usually most of the wine we, we goes there, and the, and the liquor is in that white cabinet that we saw. And this area here, though, this is the area that you have traditionally referred to as being um, the family room. Yes. Okay. This chair that's right here, this is the brown chair that we're talking about that was your father's chair? Yes. And the table there in the center is the table that you would be doing drugs from. Yes. And the couch that is sitting there, you can see the TV in the corner. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And all of these rooms from where we first saw in the kitchen, you saw that there was there was a rug there. Here is also an area rug. Mm -hmm. Right? You have to say yes or no, just can't. Yes, sorry. So in the main portion of the house where this is happening, there are a number of area rugs that are underneath the furniture. There are. Right? Okay. And this is the way we 
way your parents' house is all we want. Yes. Okay. So, I, Mr. Scandarito, you didn't you didn't have a fight with your dad? No. On March the 28th, right? No. You ever had a fight with your dad like that, a physical fight? No, I've never had a physical fight in my life with anybody. Okay. And you didn't kill him? I did not kill my dad. Okay. Um, you certainly made some bad decisions. Horrible decisions. Okay. But you did not participate in any way in causing the death of your father. I did not. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ramsey. I'm going to turn now to the uh, state for cross-examination. Mr. Parnfield. Thank you. say they were fine yes okay you were you had uh didn't pay your february rent until the 8th of march right i don't know when i paid it but you saw the email right the email that you sent to mr Shear. it said that he had received it i didn't know when they received it okay and then you didn't pay your march rent that month right no and you didn't have the money to pay your april rent that month did you i had the money okay uh, you said that you had a bad credit? Yes. And was that because of the situation with your car, right? No, I've had bad credit since college. You had a problem with your car, though, in 2017, right? Yes. And you had to surrender the Mercedes, right? I, uh, my a girlfriend, it's a diesel, and uh, I lent it to a girlfriend, and she put unleaded gasoline in it, so it destroyed the engine. And um, they would not uh, cover it on warranty. So, you had to surrender the so I so I left the I left it at the dealership. Right, and um, you also used to have credit cards, right? Yes. But they got taken away, right? Taken away? Yeah. I mean, didn't you have a judgment against you because of the credit card? I have had problems with many credit cards, yes. Right, and your father had to pay it, didn't he? he? He paid when we got into divorce. Mm -hmm. He paid some credit card that we had, yes. Right, but he, his credit was being affected because of your spending habits, right? Correct, because that was a, a joint credit card that I got with him in college. And that was in 2017? No, the, the credit card that you're referring to that he paid uh, for, that was a credit card that I took out in 1987 in college, my first credit card. Right, but the balance, the, when it was affecting him, wasn't that in 2016 or 2017? No. In March of 2000, all right, let's go back to February. So in February of 2018, um, Dr. Shear tries to call you to find out why the rent's due, right? Yes. And you ignore the phone calls. Right. I don't know if I ignored him. I, I didn't talk to him. Right. They went to voicemail. Yes. And your phone is equipped with an app that records your voicemails, right? Records, yes, sure. And you checked your voicemail and you heard Dr. Shear tell you to pay rent, didn't you? I'm not sure if I checked it or not, but yes, if he said I did, I did. Well, if you did and it was recorded, there'd be a recording of it, right? Sure. And then um, on February 27th, you get a phone call from a debt collector that you check on your voicemail too, right? Which one's that? Evergreen Debt Collectors. Do you recall getting a phone call from them in February uh, 27, 2018? I don't. But if it was in your voicemail, there would be a recording of that too, right? I believe so. Uh, you had a UPS box, right? Yes. And uh, your UPS box uh, was, I think, box 306? Uh, yes. And you got a phone call from the UPS people telling you your payment for the UPS box was past due on March 24, 2018, right? Probably. Okay. And uh, you let that go to voicemail, and you heard that voicemail when you called it, right? I know uh, that that was paid. 
Okay. When was it paid? I don't know, sh shortly after. Sometime between March 24th and March 28th, you paid your UPS bill? I saw, I, th I thought I saw that it was paid. Okay. Um, and then uh, we talked about your Comcast bill, right? Yes. Um, that's for internet service? I have free wi I had free Wi-Fi at, um, at my building. Right. And uh, your your front desk manager was Brett at Avenue Lofts? Uh, Brett is a maintenance maintenance guy, I think. Right. So on the 26th of March, Brett calls you to tell you that the Comcast people are there to take your cable away, right? I'm not sure. Don't remember. Um, you told us that, uh, before you told us about your income from drug dealing, you said that you primarily do real estate, right? I don't sell real estate. I consult with brokers. Well, you said that you had been a manager for real estate before. Yes. And you haven't been a manager of real estate since you left Sotheby's, right? That's correct. And that was in 2014? Uh, early 2015. Early 2015. That was around the time that you were making like $220,000. Yes. And then since that time, you moved to become uh, a trainer or a coach to try to bring leads into a real estate company, right? I, uh, I help real estate companies set up better business processes, including generating leads, including training for their agents, uh, help them set up systems that can, they can improve their productivity. So you do like freelance consulting, right? I would say yes. And you did that for Mac and Realty for a while? Yes. And there's a period of time where you leave Mac and Realty uh, and you are not employed by another real estate agency. Is that correct? Yes. And during that time period, uh, your father gives you, I believe, $4,500, right? Uh, yes. Uh, once you get picked back up by uh, Colfax, which is the real estate company that you're working with until 2018, uh, you are receiving a salary from Colfax. Same 1099 uh, independent contractor uh, consulting agreement. Right. No salary. So you would be receiving approximately $4,500 in income from Colfax when you're full time. Right? Full. Uh, yes. Right. So there's a time period where you're working for full, Colfax full time. No, I mean, I'm a consultant. Isn't there a time when Colfax tells you that you are going to be switched from full-time to part-time and your salary is reduced by half? It's, it's the end of the uh, consulting agreement. So we, we moved from a, a full-time consulting to have part-time consulting. And your salary is reduced to $2,500? Yes. Right? And then that happened, that's in December of 2017, right? Yes. The um, contract is supposed to end in December and we extended it for a few more months. And you're actually told um, you're actually told that that is a trial period of three months, correct? The first group set, yes. Okay, so three months from December 2017 would be March of 2018, right? Col yes. And Colfax, uh, you no. Say that again. Three months from December 2017 is March 2018. I thought it was from August to the to, to uh, when I started till December. Did you receive an email from the, the boss at Colfax setting forth what the, the terms would be? Uh, originally, yes. And would that refresh your memory about the terms of the agreement? Sure. May I approach the witness? You may. That's correct. So you were on part time, and you were receiving, uh, you were going to work from December to March on a part time trial basis, right? Yes. The part time trial basis that you were going to receive, you were going to receive $2,250 a month, right? Correct. And that at that time, your rent had just been increased to $2,800 a month, right? Uh, in December of that month, yeah. Right. So. As of December of 2018, your money from Colfax, or your money from your, your primary source of income, is, uh, is now less than your rent, right? Yes, it is. Most of the time, it's less than my rent. Okay. But you're telling us now you're supplementing your income by selling drugs? Well, yeah, right? since 2015, yes. Okay. 
Uh, you had told us a little bit about yourself. You said that uh, you have a bachelor's in business, right? Correct. And you have a law training, but you never practiced as a lawyer. Law degree, but never practiced. Okay. But you've been trained in law. Fair to say? If getting a, having a law degree is training? Is it up to you? Do you believe that that's training? Have you had, did you graduate law school? I did. Okay. Um, and you had an opportunity to read the police reports and all the investigations in this case? As much as I've been provided, yes. You got a chance to listen to uh, or read depositions and uh, read other statements taken by witnesses? Yes. Right? And you're, you've been able to sit here through the whole testimony of all the witnesses before you testify to what you testified to you today? Right? Yes. You not passing the bar was a source of friction with your father, wasn't it? They were disappointed, my mother and my dad, sure. But your father more so than your mother because he had passed the bar, right? He wanted, he wanted me to go to law school. He wanted me to be a lawyer. Okay. And you, you would argue with them on occasion about that, right? Not in 20 some years, but yeah, okay. at the time. You were closer to your mother than you were to your father? Uh, earlier on, I was, yeah. And uh, but, your mother was concerned about your relationship with your father, wasn't she? Uh, I don't know about concern. I don't think she was concerned. Did she t make your father promise to take better care of you once you passed? I know. I don't know that. You told us, I think you told us that you moved because you had, because of the issues with your father, the, the scandal that happened to your father? Yes. Um, and that was one of the reasons that you moved away? That was the reason I moved, yeah. So you presented him for that, right? Yeah, back then, yes. But I did, he was the one that I, when I drove cross country to move, I took him with me, so. Right. Um, but. <clears throat> He also was the person that you were paying your car payment to, right? In 2018. The car payment that was $160 and I was giving him 400. Okay. So once your mom passed, uh, which was shortly after the time that you lost the Mercedes, you needed a vehicle, right? Correct. I was renting and, and he, he, he to his name. my mom couldn't drive that car anymore, so they gave it to me. Okay, so the, re the vehicle reversed to your father's name, right? It's still in my father's name. And then he basically gives it to you if you pay a car payment, right? No, he gave it to me, and I give him $400 a month. Uh, and you saw that there was a time where your father threatened to take the vehicle away from you, right? Yes, because I wouldn't pay, uh, didn't pay his son pass ticket. Right, so yeah. he didn't give it to you if he's threatening to sell it out from under you, right? Well, that's how my dad is. He's, you know... Typical. He, yeah. He's difficult. Especially about money. Yes. Right? Especially when you need money from him, right? I never asked him for money. You told us about your marijuana usage, and I think you told us about your cocaine usage, too. When did you start using cocaine? Um, college. How long were you using cocaine for when you were uh, in uh, in Palm Beach County or in Boca Raton? Like, when did you use cocaine during the time period for this case? Um, maybe a couple of times. Okay. Um, how do you get your cocaine? How normal people buy drugs from somebody that sells cocaine, or you had a drug dealer, right? or I had uh, trade with marijuana products. Okay, and uh, you set it up with your phone because that's how drug dealers do business, right? Usually, so or face to face. So what's the contact in your phone that's your drug dealer? I don't know. It's not in my phone. You had said that your father uh, drank frequently and heavily, right? I didn't say heavily, but... He drank frequently? Yes. Are you saying he doesn't drink heavily? On occasion he drinks heavily, but he drinks frequently. Do you agree with uh, when Mr. Leduc and Mr. Gooden say that your father did not drink to excess? Well, I, I know Mr. Leduc said he drinks two beers at the Duck, but most of the time when he's with me, he drinks more than two beers. 
Okay, but you've been to the Duck with Mr. LeDuc before, and your dad, right? I don't think I've ever been there with Mr. LeDuc, but certainly with my dad and Tommy and Gary. Okay, and your father drank two beers when you get the Duck, right? He would drink more than two beers. Okay, so uh, talking about this, the story that you told us about 28, uh, you indicated that your father got the golf. Or did you get the golf 15 minutes early, or was it your father? I got there 15 minutes early. My dad was there already. Okay. And uh, your father never mentioned anything to you about a meeting woman or anything like that? No, that was all made up lie. That was a lie. Um, you said that uh, after you golfed, you went home, you hung out, and you watched TV. Uh, I think you said that you bathed and ate edibles, and is your testimony your father did the same? Correct. Um, and you said that you, you saw your dad take pain pills for his knee, right? Yes. Did you see him do that, or did you know that because you got to read the toxicologist report? No, I saw him take pills, and I knew it was pain pills because he had them with him in Key West. Okay, so he took those prescriptions from 2006 with him to Key West to take? I don't think he gets, I don't, I think he gets... Percocet from another source. So he has Percocets, but he gets Percocets from another source. I don't know where he gets his drugs. Uh, you told the jury today that your father was depressed, uh, and he spoke to you about being depressed, right? Around the holidays he was, yes. Okay, but you did tell the police that his mental state was fine, right? Yes, I did. So are you saying you were lying to the police then? I was saying that he was depressed around the holidays. Okay. Um, and I think today you said you were downplaying his medical condition on April 1st, 2018, right? When you talked to Detective Curtis, you were downplaying his medical condition? Is that your testimony? I think I was stating it as it was. He's got a bad heart, he's got bad knees, he's got bad hip. Right, but you didn't say that he was suicidal, right? He wasn't suicidal. Right. You said he would never do anything like that for himself, right? And um, you said that he had a bad heart, but he was very active, right? Yes. Because he was very active, right? He was active. And you didn't see him having any uh, any indications of having any heart problems in March 2018, right? Uh, I didn't. I think the next thing that you indicated was that uh, Betty called the house. Did you actually hear that conversation? Yes, my dad called her first, left a message, she called back, and I was on the couch next to him, and he was on the chair talking on the phone. Right, and it upset you that your father was talking to Betty on the night that you were supposed to be celebrating your mother, right? Not at all. I mean, you knew that your father was starting to get over your mother's loss, right? I had hoped so. You were starting to see people seriously? My dad's cheated on my mother for my whole life, so, uh, I, you know, Betty, the relationship they may have had doesn't bother me because I'm used to his infidelity right. for so my whole knew, life. You knew you stand to gain his entire estate if he passed, and if he got married, that would stand in your way, right? No. I would never think that way. So I think then the next thing that you said was that you do cocaine, right? Yes. And uh, you did the cocaine in the family room? Correct. And your father was there and didn't take it? He said he had a good buzz. Right. In fact, you, you indicated that you were surprised that your father didn't have any cocaine in his house. I was. Um, and then you said that uh, you decided to go outside to talk to your friend because you didn't want to smoke in the house because your mother died of lung cancer. Right? And I always, when I take phone calls or I chat, I always go back out to the patio. Okay. Um, and you got a chance to read the discovery and know that the police found a cigarette butt in that area, in the outside area of the house, right? I'm sure they found dozens. And uh, your father is okay with you smoking pot? Yes. Fine with you smoking cigars? Yes. And you knew, he knew that you smoked cigarettes, right? I kept it from him a little bit, but yes, he knew. But your testimony is today you had to go outside to keep that away from him, right? Well, I can't smoke in the house. It's 
You can be smoking pot in the house, right? Vape. That's not, that doesn't. Um, and then uh, we went over some of the WhatsApp texts with Myara uh, starting at 10 to 11, right? 10 Start. to 11, 28? Yes. And is your testimony that you were outside that entire time except for one time that you came in for the bathroom? That's my testimony. You said that uh, you were probably outside watching your iPad. You remember saying that? Yes. And I think you said later when you were talking about the vehicle going to Boca Chica, you probably brought the vehicle to Boca Chica, right? Do you have a memory of what you were doing that day? I do. And it's not influenced by being under the influence of cocaine, alcohol, and marijuana? Some things, I'm sure. So you said that when you finally come in, uh, you see your father, he's on the ground, you shake him, there's no pulse, you try to do CPR and he feels cool, right? Yes. And uh, I think you said that the next thing that you saw was that uh, your father had fallen down, knocked cocaine everywhere, and your first reaction was, uh, did he do the line of cocaine, right? My first reaction was to lift the bag of cocaine up and more spilled out. And then I just believed that he must, and the only way he would have, and the chair was closed. You know, he obviously, it's an electric chair, so he, he closed the chair, he stood up. He must have <coughs> bent over and done a line of cocaine. I don't know how else he would have felt, but unless he had a heart attack and dropped dead right there. All right, and you said you were uh, worried that he overdosed. You were very worried, right? Sure. And you yourself were, I think you said, uh, you, were, you were under the influence of all those substances, right? I was. And you needed to clean up the drugs in the house, right? Yes. And you were afraid, you didn't want to face 911. Those were your words. I didn't want to face 911 in the condition that I'm in, right? 100%. So instead of talking to the 911 people, you told us you went to Walmart and started asking for ways to get a, a, some type of dolly or some type of hand truck to move your father, right? I looked around for a dolly. I couldn't find one. I asked somebody if, if they have it. I couldn't believe the Walmart wouldn't have one. Did you go in the garage before you left the house? I did. And did you see the two vacuums that were there? I saw the two vacuums. And you didn't think to use the vacuums to clean up the cocaine? I couldn't move my dad to clean, to use the vacuum. You couldn't move your dad to, to use the vacuum, but you're able to lift him onto a hand truck. Uh, yeah. You saw how tight that space was. So you indicated that you couldn't find anything at Walmart that worked for you to help move your father? I couldn't find a dolly. And again, you're too afraid to call 911 because you don't want to get in trouble, right? Yes. You don't want to get in trouble for your father overdosing at your father's house. Is that what you're saying? Yes. You don't want to get in trouble for your father overdosing at your father's house when you're not even there. Right? Because you could have called 911 from Walmart to have your phone on you. Hey, I haven't heard from my dad. Can somebody send somebody out? You couldn't do that? I could. I don't think that makes any sense. It makes more sense to dismember your father and bury his torso? No, that makes the least amount of sense. You ultimately end up uh, getting the dolly from Home Depot and the gas can from Home Depot, right? Yes. And you told this jury you had to get the gas can to explain why it wasn't your first thing dolly, right? Yes. And you told them that because you heard the phone call where that's what you told Tech Curtis, right? I told that, but I, I, I told Mr. I told Detective Curtis that. Right, and you heard it today. The jury heard you tell Detective Curtis that today. Yes. Right? Um, but you actually did take the power washer to go to your house, right? I didn't. Not no. Didn't Arnie LeDuc and your father and you go power wash your balcony a few months back? A few months back, yes. Right. So you took a story um, that you were familiar with and just made it into a lie. Right? No, I, I needed to power wash the, the, the balcony every few months. Did, have you seen the picture of my balcony from the, the interview, the exit interview of my place? It's, it's a huge balcony. Right. But what I'm, what I'm saying is you used that explanation to craft your life to Detective Curtis. Explain why you were buying the dolly on the planet. Right? I don't know if 
if it was to craft the lie to tell Mr. Curtis or to, for the reason I was buying the, the gas can. But she ended up using the gas to try to burn your father's torso. Right? I did. You didn't mention that on your direct account. I wasn't, I wasn't asked that question. I think you said that uh, after Home Depot, you come back uh, and uh, you're concerned because Ernie has the key to the house and you're, you know that Betty Butcher is supposed to come to the house, right? I wasn't sure if my dad was picking her up or she might come over. Right. And I think in your timeline when you were talking to Ms. Ramsey, uh, you said that somewhere around 7 to 7.30 you became concerned that Betty Butcher would be there. So you decided to send a text from your father's phone to Betty Butcher. Right? I, think it was, I think it was before 7. Right. It was, it was 6.45, right? Okay. So it was pretty much immediately after you had gotten the Home Depot. 6.15 I got back, right? Something like that. Right. And then you said you broke down uh, because you couldn't leave the body in the hallway. Um, and you couldn't move the body any further, right? Yep. Yes. And at this time, you still could have called 911, but you didn't. At any time after I found him, I could have called 911. So what you do do is you take your father's vehicle and leave it at the Boca Tica apartment complex, right? Yes. That's right by Ocean Breeze? It is. And then you walk back to the car? I walk back to the house. All right. I'm sorry, you walk back to the house to take your car. Yes. Right? And you drive down to Miami. When did you turn your phone off? I don't remember. I mean, you turned your phone off because you didn't want the police to be able to track your movements, right? My battery could have been dead. I don't remember. You knew you had your father's phone on you, right? Yes, I took the, my dad's phone with me. Right. And you knew your father's phone was powered on, right? I don't and you got a chance to hear about the movements that the police were able to track on your father's phone when Detective Noya testified today. Right? I heard that, yes. Before you testified. Um, when did you take your dad's bottle? Uh, the same time I left uh, to go to uh, the golf, uh, the tennis tournament. Okay, so when you left Beaufort's home for the first time? Yes. Well, I mean, if you had money, like you're telling us, why did you need your father's wallet? Because I was going to make a charge to show that he was uh, still alive on that day, like I did with Publix. Right, but I thought you were concerned you had to come up with a story for why you would be at Home Depot in the morning. You know that the police can get those videos. So why would you do a charge with your father's credit card when you know you're going to be on the video? I made a bunch of stupid decisions. I'm not a, you know, career criminal that plans, you know, well, it was because you didn't have any money, right? I, I had money. I paid. I just spent a hundred dollars, a uh, hundred dollar bill at golf the day before. You did. You spent a hundred dollar bill at golf the day before. You also made a Capital One transfer on March 29th to your strike account, the amount of fourteen hundred dollars. Yes. Well, why would you do that if you had all this money? At, at that time, I thought I needed to have some clean money in my account, as opposed to the drug the, money, the cash drug money that you have. Correct. Well, if you're tracking your account, people can track your account. They can't track the drug money. Wouldn't you want to have all the drug money on you so you could do whatever you needed without being tracked? No, I wanted to have some legitimate money in my account in case I had to, you know, do pay, pay for something for, you know, my dad's funeral or, or something. You can actually ask the police on, like, April 3rd if it's okay to transfer money into your account, right? I did. And that's because you didn't... No, I asked, him, I asked him if I could use, if I could pay, start paying some of their bill, his bills. Right, because you didn't want them to think it's suspicious that you're accessing your father's money, right? Yeah, I guess. I, yeah. It, but in your version of what happens, before you're, even at the part where you're dismembering your father, you're taking money out of his bank account and putting it into yours, right? Yes, but I knew that money wasn't going to come in for five, six days because it was through Stripe. So it's not like I was taking it to use at that point in time. Right. If I um, needed that kind of money, why wouldn't I take out all the money that I, that I needed, if I needed money? Because you wanted to make sure that your father was declared missing. That's why you came up with the story that you told the police. Right? So you could get all of his money and his house. That was n no. No. <laughs> 
So you he, go to Publix, you told us that you went to Publix, you bought the garbage bags, the towels, the mop. Um, and then I think the next part of your story was that you actually do the process of dismembering the phone, right? Yes. And you told the members of the jury, basically, you take his arms and his legs and you place them into one, um, one of the suitcases, right? Arms, legs, and head. Okay. And then you said uh, you saw the torso in half, and you placed that in the other suitcase? Yes. You told us that there was a tarp that you played, placed down because you just didn't want to see what you were doing, right? Yes. Where did the tarp come from? Both the tarps were in the garage. So they were there already? Yeah, and I had a, uh, a poncho on. And what did you do with the poncho? Put it into the bags. Which bag uh, contained your uh, your father's arms, legs, and head? It was a suitcase. I, I don't know. I can I can describe the suitcases to you. They're all large suitcases that were in the garage, up on top of the, one of the shelves. There's the green one and the black one, or is it a separate one entirely? Separate one entirely. Okay. Because those were found with the other um, right, right, body right, parts. The torso. Correct. Did you put each? part of the torso into a separate one of those bags? Yes. And you have, those are your suitcases actually? None of those were my suitcases, they were all my dad's, from my dad's house. Well, one of the matching suitcases is found in your apartment. It's not my suitcase, that's, that was, uh, I didn't make any sense what you guys were doing in terms of showing my suitcases in my apartment. I didn't take any suitcase from my apartment. Did you see any in the video, me walking with a, with a suitcase? I did. Okay. All right, well please. Mr. Skinner, you know, the process is the I prosecutor understand. is asking questions. It's okay, I understand every now and then, but all right, don't make a habit of it. Next question, please. Um, and then you said it felt like it took you all night, so you had to keep going outside to smoke cigarettes, right? Vomited a couple times. But you said it, it, all in all it wasn't a lot of cleanup, right? Correct. It didn't make that much of a mess, right? I mean... I mean, he wasn't spraying blood or anything like that because he's dead, right? No, there was no, no. So the next part of what you told us was that you, uh, you started to load the bags containing your father's body parts into his SUV. Yes. And then uh, Mr. LeDuc walks up to you and says hello, right? Yes. And you said somebody else walked by and said hi to Skip. Yes. What, what does that mean? A neighbor was walking through the neighborhood and said, hi, Skip. To you? Yes. Okay. So somebody thought that you were your father? Yes. So you have a conversation with Ernie, right? I did. And then you begin to get concerned that Ernie might know what's going on, right? I mean, I was concerned from the minute, you know, I didn't call 911. Well, I mean, you get concerned that Ernie is suspicious because you text Ernie from your father's phone to try to throw him off of what's going on, right? I tried to t text it with Ernie because I figured that I would have talked to my dad and my dad would have mentioned something to Ernie. Right, so you're, you're trying to still pretend yeah, that your I'm father's I'm I'm Yes, I'm in the middle of creating some kind of a lie here. You know that. Right. Um... And then I think this is when you said you went to Boca Tica, you sort of staged the body parts in Boca Tica and the bushes, and then go to Starbucks? No, that's, that was incorrect. Okay. Well, I, went to Star I went to Starbucks in, in the um, Prius. Okay. So you go to, is that after or before you staged the bags? The bags were still in my dad's truck. Okay. So you load up your dad's truck, you leave in the Prius, and then you come back and take your dad's truck to Boca Tica? <coughs> Both cars somehow were, in, were at Boca Tica. How? It's driving them both, one one at a time. Yes, somehow I drove one and came back, and there's a video of me leaving and coming back and walking right. back. Yeah. On the 29th. Um, but this was on the 30th, according to you. Then the police missed me walking back on the 30th. Okay. Um, why did you go to the Walgreens in your father's truck when you were trying to put the body parts of Boca Tica? You know, I don't remember. 
You don't remember? I don't remember why I did a, a, a few of these things. Okay. Um, you said you went back for the suitcases after the dark, or after dark on the 30th, right? Yes. And, and that's when you put your father's arms, legs, and head into a construction dumpster at Bocadica Pica? Yes. And then you also threw away the lighter bags at Bocadica, right? Everything but the torso and the uh, bottom part. And you're telling us the only reason you didn't throw away the torso is because you couldn't lift it. That's correct. You had cut the torso in half, so that would make the sections lighter, right? Still too heavy for me to lift. Barely could put it into the suitcase. And you decided you're going to bury this, the suitcases, but you, you don't know where at that time, right? I mean, somewhere on the golf course. I had no idea where. That's when you start Googling the layout of Ocean Breeze? I think I, I think it, I don't know exactly when that was, but I think that was to find where the, you know, the shed was. Or, you the know. The pump house? The pump house, yeah. The, the photograph that we saw of the pump house? I think that's what I was trying to find, where that was. And where were we trying to find that? Because I thought that would be a place to hide the, the, the suitcases. But then you choose to bury them on the golf course, right? I did. And you bury them on the golf course the night that the police kick you out of the house to do the search warrant. Yes. Right? Yes. So they had been sitting there near the pump house area for several days. Yes. Because you couldn't get away from the police and from Gary Gooden and from everybody long enough to actually finish the act of hiding your father's butt. Yes. Now you're still Googling how to escape the country. Uh, you're Googling... Uh, how long does a person have to be missing to be presumed dead during this time period? The minute that we called the police, you know, I knew I was, you know, this was going to end badly. Right. And uh, you were also Googling different ways to transfer money into your Bank of America account. Right? You're trying to see if, uh, what the maximum transfer amount would be? Uh, Yes. That did, that's nice. You're trying to see if you can transfer the money with your Zelle account? Right? I'm not sure what Zelle is. Okay, well, I mean, you typed it into Google, didn't you? I might have clicked the link. I don't know. <clears throat> and then I think you had said that you didn't view your father as wealthy, right? No. Well, you knew he received a life insurance policy when your mother passed, right? Yeah, I thought it was, I didn't think it was that much. I didn't know. Well, you knew that you were supposed to get half of it, and, and you didn't actually receive that amount, right? I didn't think I was supposed to get any of it. You knew that all you got from it was $5,000, right? I knew that, yes. And that was during that time period when you were between jobs, right? I've always had a job. Right. The, the, uh, that was during the time period when you were not employed by either uh, Mackin or uh, Colfax. But I was employed by Lyft or Uber. That's true, and, and I misspoke. Um, I've always had some form of le legal income coming coming in either through a consulting gig or through uh, Uber or Lyft. Right. I should say then uh, that was during the time period where you did not have a uh, a real estate job. Right. When was the time frame? Uh, in August two thousand seven. I think I just started at Colfax in August, but right around that time. Okay. But the, it wasn't, it, it, it's not rele relevant. Okay. Um, so you, uh, you told us that what you do is you sold uh, illegal drugs, right? They're illegal. They were, yes, they're illegal here. I mean, they're legal in Colorado, but they're not legal here. That's correct. Right? You're selling marijuana and marijuana edibles. Edibles and oils, right? right. Not, not the leaf. Okay. Well, who do you sell them to in your phone? Like, what are some of the, the conversations in your phone where you're setting up drug deals? I mean, they're in Facebook Messenger or they're in WhatsApp. They're all in WhatsApp? Is that yes or no? They're not all in WhatsApp. Okay. How about in your actual phone? In your contacts? They're mainly through Facebook Messenger. 
the marijuana that you were getting from Colorado, I mean, you never drove there, right? No. You only fly, right? I've flown. I, I, I would receive it through the mail. Okay. But you, you also told us that you went to, I think, Oregon or Seattle? I went to Seattle. And uh, you flew there. You didn't drive there. I flew to Seattle. So any of the drugs that you got in Seattle, you would have had to fly back? Fly back. Um, so you weren't smuggling pounds of marijuana edibles, were you? Not on that trip, no. And how about on the times when you went to Colorado? I, 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 I didn't go to Colorado. Okay. I never said I went to Colorado. My dad goes to Colorado. So you told us that you traveled a lot. Yes. Uh, you said you went to Brazil four to five times, you did Colombia, right? Yep. Uh, your last visit out of the country was March 2017, right? Yeah, I thought it was April. <coughs> exactly. I think you said March or April, but yeah. it was a, about a year before this took place. That's correct. And you couldn't afford to leave the United States between your last visit and today. That's not true. Ms. Ramsey asked you some questions about my art. She right? did. She did. Um, and you told us that uh, it was an online friendship that you made in 2015 or 2016, right? Yes. Um, and you met her on a website? I did. And uh, that website... What's the name of that was? Um, I don't know if it was Tinder. The Seeking Arrangements? Could be Seeking Arrangements. Okay. And on Seeking Arrangements, she was a person that was looking for a... Objection. I'm sorry, now. What, what was the question, Ms. Barnfield? I hadn't finished it, Ms. Ramsey. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think we should approach before I ask the whole question. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Objection is a rule council you may imply. You met her on a website uh, called Seeking Arrangements, right? Yes. And that's a website where uh, younger women can look for people that have money to sponsor them, right? I wouldn't say that's how it, it is. Well, the younger women are called sugar babies, right? Sugar babies and sugar daddies? Uh, right, and the older men are sugar daddies, right? Yes. So you met her on that website uh, to be her sugar dad, right? And that's not, that wasn't my purpose. You met her in Brazil, right? I did. And you became quite fond of her, didn't you? We've got a good friendship, yes. I mean, in March of 2017, you sent a picture of her to your friends and say, I met the future Mrs. Scandaria. I don't remember that. I'm never getting married again, so unless it's, you know. Well, she asked you to marry her, didn't she? She did, yes. And that was in December of 2017, right? I don't remember when it was. For a green card. Like I got married to Katja, my ex-wife, for her green card. Right, but she asked you to marry her like you said, the end of December of 2017, right? I don't remember when. It's the, around the same time that you lost uh, your, your job at Colfax went part-time, right? You keep corresponding my uh, real estate jobs with, with dating and things like that, because I know that's where you want to go with it, but they're not related at all. Was it at the same time that your real estate job became part-time? I don't know when the email that you're referring to. Did she uh, come to visit you in the United States? She did. And you were, in fact, uh, very taken with her. You were in love with her, right? No. You never told her that you loved her? I might have said that, but I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't love her. You wanted to 
assist her financially so that she would stay with you, right? I wanted to help her with her medical career. You want her to be with you, right? Yeah, I'd like to spend more time with her. But she was spending time with other people that had more money than you, wasn't she? No, she was... Every, wherever she was at, she was using seeking arrangements for other relationships with other men. Right, that's why she was in New York. She was in New York because she loves New York. Right, but she's also with a friend from Seeking Arrangements, right? I don't know if she met him in Seeking Arrangements, but you know, she has other friends, just like I've got other friends. It's not, you know, there's no exclusivity. And you were afraid that you were going to lose her if you didn't have money. I was not, I'm not afraid of that. that I, I don't worry about those things. All right, let me turn back to Ms. Ramsey for redirect examination. Just briefly, Judge. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Scandarito, I mean, did you, did you kill your dad when you needed to have a postal box? <laughs> I didn't kill my dad. Okay, or for Comcast cable or for the rent bill? No, I did not kill my dad for any okay. of those things. Okay, your dad and you had a very open relationship? We were really cool with each other. We were good friends. And back in, I know the state kept referring to it as 2017, but it's actually 2010, 11, when you got divorced from Katya. Yes. Okay, and at that time, um, you resolved some of the debt that was from the marriage with your parents paying it off. Yes. Okay, and I, I mean, when your mother died, your father gifted you some money at that time. He did. All right. Um, if you had really needed money to get by, what would you do? Well, first I would have asked my dad if I really needed money, um, or I would have worked. And would he have given it to you? Uh, absolutely. Okay, because he had in the past. Yes. Okay, so this is not a motivation for you to get rid of your dad? I would, no, I love my dad. Okay. When we talked, the state was talking to you briefly about, you know, using cocaine and buying cocaine, selling marijuana. Um, that happened some through Lyft and Uber services, right? Yes. Um, when I talked to, I think it was um, one of the financial people was talking about multiple trips on Uber and Lyft that you were taking and going places. When that happened, what were you doing? That was either bar hopping or it was, you know, maybe selling. Okay. Did you sell in bars? Mm -hmm. A little bit, not much. Okay. Did you buy in bars? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Okay. All right. At any rate, when the state is asking you specifically about contacts for either buyers or seller of drugs, that makes you uncomfortable? Of course it does. Okay. All right. Um, and when the state was asking you about getting drugs from Seattle, Colorado, did, you never went to Colorado. I never went to Colorado. Your dad went to Colorado. That's my dad's spot. And your dad bought stuff for you to sell. He did. Okay. He didn't make a profit off of this business? No. But you would gift him things from what you got? Yes. Okay. Personal use. And that's all I have. All right, Mr. Scandarito, you can step down, sir, and join uh, Mr. Arters out on his hands back at the council table. And with that, let me just see the attorneys up here at the bench.
All right, folks, I was just spending some time here with the, the, you know, the attorneys and discussing our schedule. We're going to recess now for today, and it's my fault. It's not their fault. They're all ready to go. They're actually pushing to, to continue and finish this trial. I have a personal matter outside of this courthouse that I have to attend to. Um, so um, please forgive me for breaking a little early today, but we're going to get back together at 9 o'clock tomorrow. I believe as we had discussed when we first started picking you guys almost two weeks ago, that the case will be in your hands at the end of the day tomorrow. I want you to always remember this. There is never a time limit in discussing a case and coming to a decision as to what the right result is in this case. And that is, don't feel ever forced. If you get the case, for example, at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, hey, look, you can just get organized and back in the jury room and ready, and you know that you got all Thursday to continue your deliberations. The case is too important to rush to judgment, um, so make sure that you take the time that is necessary to discuss the case with each other, and make sure that you consider all of the arguments of counsel and my instructions on the law. But the case probably won't be in your hands if tomorrow until near the end of the day tomorrow, but we'll talk to the attorneys about that. We may just come back Thursday morning and get the case in your hands then, but uh, I'm not sure. We'll see how what happens tomorrow morning, and. We're going to get back together. And I, please forgive me for going to Thursday. It's, I know, but still, it's this week, okay, as I had indicated to you. So, um, we're going to get together tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock sharp, as we have done today. And uh, at that time, I'll turn back to Ms. Ramsey, and uh, we'll continue with the trial of this cause. Please make sure you don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't let anybody discuss this case with you. Don't no internet research about this case. Don't look up anything on the news media. Don't read any articles or watch any television shows concerning this case. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And is there anything else that you wish for me to instruct the jurors from either side? All right. Have a safe trip home. Leave your pads on your chairs. And we'll see you in the morning. to discuss this evening before we recess for you. No. All right. All right. See you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And we'll make sure that we have Mr. Scandarito up here, guys. Mo, 9 o'clock sharp, buddy. Thank you. As always, thank you so much. All right. Did you guys get the numbers all straight now with the deputy clerk? Please.